All right, welcome everybody to our panel discussion on Beyond the Digital Identity. My name is Chris Mack. I'm with Basis Technology, a 20-year-old natural language processing company where I am uh, taking our expertise in uh, entity analytics and combining it with the latest machine learning technologies to build a new identity resolution platform. Um, I'm uh, joined by five panelists. Let's di dive right in. I'm going to do quick introductions, uh, and then we'll, um, we'll move on to some of the content. So first, I've got Brian Hurd. Uh, Brian joins us uh, with uh, more than 25 years of experience in cybersecurity, terrorism, and homeland security. Uh, that includes uh, multiple uh, senior roles at the National C Center for Counterterrorism, uh, where he worked directly on identity resolution systems that, that keep us safe every day. Uh, Brian's seen firsthand the disconnects that happen between uh, data sources and, and, and the users that are trying to connect the dots. Uh, today, he's uh, VP of Operations at Strauss Friedberg, uh, the risk management and cyber consulting firm. Next, we have Tony Smith. Uh, Tony has over 40 years of experience in border management and border security, including his time as Director General of the, uh, of the, of the Home Office in the United Kingdom. Uh, his, his expertise in identity resolution is based on hands-on experience across uh, all areas of the immigration and border, uh, 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 border control process from the front line to management and senior policy. Uh, today he works as a consultant uh, with uh, Fortinus Global. And uh, next, to, next to Tony, we've got Stefan Trouvé, uh, who has over 40 years of combined experience. I'm sorry. My card's got in the wrong order. You guys are sitting in the wrong order. <laughs> it's my fault. I know. I know. Uh, so Stefan uh, is co-founder and CFO of Recorded Future, uh, where identity resolution plays a key role uh, in uh, creating threat intelligence signals uh, out of billions of data points collected from open, uh, deep, and dark webs. And then, and then we've got Glenn. Glenn Denitz, uh, who has over four years of combined experience in law enforcement, big four consulting, and executive roles. Uh, he's deeply aware of the challenges and the opportunities of identity resolution from his decades of work in anti-bribery, uh, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering, and anti-fraud. Anti uh, today, Glenn is responsible for anti-money laundering and financial crime products at eClerks. And finally, at the end, John Frank. John is CEO and co-founder of Diffio, where he focuses on helping people digest complex information using collaborative machine intelligence. John's previous startup was Metacarta who pioneered uh, map-based uh, entity search, uh, and that was bought by um, Nokia in 2010. So welcome, everyone, and welcome to the audience. Um, and um, I think just really quick before we dive in with questions, um, I just want to get a sense of, of who we've got in the room uh, in terms of like business folks, folks technology people, uh, or consultants and policy folks. So if, if I could just get a show of hands real quick, who out of those would identify themselves as you know, business operations? All right, a, a section of the room. And then who would say they're more on the technology front? Oh, wow, pretty big percentage, more than I expected. Excellent. And then policy and consulting? Throw those, throw those together, all right. Excellent, a little a, a showing, that's excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, so. Uh, that, that definitely gives us a little bit of context to dive in and know a bit about who our, who our audience is. Um, I, think, I think I'll start by holding my mic, right? Um, and just getting a level set about identity resolution, because identity resolution is rarely a standalone product or process. It's, part, it's always part of some larger um, um, uh, system. And whether that system is maybe doing uh, identity verification, or it's being used in anti-money laundering, or it's being used in uh, in intelligence or investigations. It's 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 a it's a it's a it's a part of a bigger puzzle. And I think just for that context, I'd like to start uh, just for each of you, uh, if you could tell me just where where you use identity resolution uh, inside your processes and your products uh, or, or operations, uh, and how that d uh, delivers value. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so as was mentioned in the introductory, I was the chief of identity and innovation for the U.S. watch listing system for many years, and the Boston bombing ran on a case management system I designed. These types, and I worked at NCIS, for your text in the audience, I founded the Navy Cyber Counterintelligence Program over at NCIS. The resolution of identity, and we were talking about this just before the panel, not only for individuals, 
the discussion that preceded this one on social security numbers was, was amazing, except everybody they were talking about was a consumer who desired to articulate their identity into a system that derives benefit for them. Most of my career has been trying to resolve identities of people who particularly did not want me to do so. Terrorists, espionage agents, people who were committing crimes on a massive scale. Those types of things as you think about identity solutions and uh, money laundering, fraud and abuse. The reason we have to think about them at the design phase is because of the complexity of trying to unify identity, behavior, travel, and what is known as derogatory material, why we think somebody is good or bad later in the process is a significant challenge. Not only train, uh, transliteration of names and things to that effect and other technical challenges we'll discuss, but then what happens when records accidentally get merged and two credit histories combine, or you show up at a border as we often have and you can't determine the identity of an individual with the same birth date, same name, same country, because they didn't register at the DMV and I don't have the passport number or other things to disambiguate good from evil. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, so I describe myself as a borders guy, really, yeah. not, a, not a techie, uh, not a great academic either, really, but I, I lived, I lived um, a life in government of 40 years which was about risk assessment and uh, as I climbed up the slippery pole in the UK Home Office and travelled around the world doing major security projects I, I did find that I would get into an awful lot of trouble if I let someone through my border that I shouldn't have done. Um, I also got in a lot of trouble if there was a long queue at my border and people like you started agitating about it or, or, or the port operators or the airlines so my job really was an impossible one. Uh, to try to de-risk people in the best way possible. So in border management, we have a, a sort of what we call the eternal triangle of a, an identity and a document and intent. And what you're trying to do is make sure that the document actually and the identity are relating to the same person. That's not always the case. It's harder now to forge documents than it used to be, but it's still possible. Uh, so a lot of counterfeit documents and counterfeit identities around, which will be used uh, by, by bad guys to try and breach uh, borders. But one thing we've never really been able to crack in my business is intent, because we don't really know what's in someone's mind, do we? Uh, you know, you can, you, can, you can find ways of doing that. And I do think that you know, some of the areas that you guys are talking about now about using profile uh, data and, and on online data and other data would, would help me with my risk assessment processes and my predecessors now running borders because what you're really trying to do, you know, 99.9% .9 of people crossing borders are perfectly genuine people. We don't want to hassle them. But it's a 0.1% that you want to stop. And how do, you, how do you know the person standing in front of you or going through your e-gate is actually who they say they are? And how do you know that there isn't something somewhere on some database somewhere? If you look at 9-11, you look at 7-7, you look at the Paris, right the way to the Paris attacks, major, major errors in terms of data sharing, data information across agencies that may well have been able to stop some of those guys. So really quite interested in how we can use uh, data better uh, with uh, other sources uh, to de-risk people and make the world a safer place for all of us. Okay, so I guess I'm a technology guy with no sense of borders, so we <laughs> complement each other nicely. So, so what we do at Recorded Future is to produce threat intelligence based on very, very broad collection of everything from big media sources down to social media to hack Russian hacker forums, things like that. So the, the challenges are the same in a sense, I could say, of course, it's a question of disambiguating you know, people and other entities with the same name or creating synonyms or aliases and also to take care of all the, the noise out there. You know, my favorite example, Condoleezza Rice, has 90 different spellings in our system and I'm, I would challenge someone to try to spell her name, by the way. Uh, anyway, so, so these kind of things uh, constantly challenge us. And then, of course, the, the, the sheer volume of this means that uh, you, you have to automate this as much as possible. We still have humans in the loop for this. We think there are still points where you must introduce humans to do it, but you really need to, to, f to focus on automating as much as possible. A special thing, I think, in terms of these high volumes is that the, the entities we are trying to ident put identifiers on, we, we care about the bad guys, just like you go do. And I think that guides the process a bit in the fact that you need to focus on how can you identify those and then put the, the good guys in a separate pile because they, you don't really need to focus as much on those. 
40 years is a long time, and I'm looking around at the audience, and probably some of you weren't even around at that time. So I started in New Jersey, the New Jersey Division of Criminal Justice in the 1970s, and I don't know how many of you remember, but we were the people, the State Police Division, developed something called profiling, which worked phenomenally well. And over the years, that became illegal to do. So I left the police, became a partner at KPMG, okay, and then 9-11 changed my life like it probably did a lot of other people. And I went back and uh, created a firm that melded technology, law enforcement, consulting, and then I did a stint at Dun & Bradstreet as their head of uh, compliance solutions. So right now, I'm, I'm, I'm doing work for a company named eClerks, and we still get down to the point that because of a lot of privacy laws and a lot of the way the world has changed, things are happening incredibly faster now, um, and, and everything is digital. And we still come up with the problem in world trade, who are you, who do, we, who do you say you are, why do you say you're that way, and how do we prove it? And uh, I do a lot, how many people are from financial services here? Okay. So the whole, uh, on the AML side, I mean, you know, what, what we have to do is we have to onboard customers almost at the speed of light. And do we really know who we're onboarding? Most of the time we do, but it's the bad guys that I'm interested in. How, how, do, how do we get to the shell companies? How do we find out who the real beneficial owners are in, in the world, okay? On the anti-bribery and corruption side, it's a little bit different because we're not regulated, but still, if you get caught, the regulators are going to ask you to do your screening due diligence. How do you know the identity of the, of the vendor? In Jersey, we used to say, I got a guy, okay? Which meant, right? I got a guy. I know a guy. That doesn't work anymore in the world today. We have to go through vendors. We have to get a list of five to, you know, five to ten vendors. We have to vet them. We have to set our RFIs and RFPs. But how do we really know who we're doing business with? Uh, my name is John Frank, and my company, Diffio, I'm a technologist like Stefan, uh, and Diffio provides a machine learning system that augments the intelligence of analysts. And the way it does that is it models their intent. You were talking about the intent of the bad guys. Uh, frequently, if you're sitting in front of a computer screen, the computer doesn't act like it understands your intent. However, there are many problems where if the machine's able to model what you're trying to do and what you know, then the machine can give you exactly the right bit of information, the right threat intelligence or trust intelligence at the right moment. So when we think about intent, there's these two sides. There's the side of the person looking out and the person that they're looking at and what their unknown intent is. One of the things I'm really interested in, I imagine many of you are interested in, is how do we manage this control of the data based on different people's intents, right? Everybody would like to be able to opt out, the, the right to be forgotten is in the, the user bill of rights. At the same time, we need to be able to not let them opt out <laughs> when we really need to track them. So how, how do we manage that difference? And similarly, w when you put all this data together into some sort of collective intelligence, who is the collective? Like, who do you decide to trust to share threat intelligence with? That's a, another layer in this trust picture of like, which are the people and how do you trust them and what attributes do you expect them to do a good job verifying? All these different levels of, of intent verification, both in our collaborators, ourselves, the people we're interacting with, it's that intent that machines really don't know how to model in a deep way yet. At Diffio, we've, we've basically focused on the easy one. If you look at what a person's working on, you can figure out their intent because you can see all the things they have open. So it's, a, it's the easiest of the intent problems. But ultimately, we need machines to figure out how to be much more in tune with all of our intents. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. So th th that's a real wide range of different um, uh, applications from border uh, to big data to, to investigations of, of how identity resolution is being uh, deployed. But I believe there are a number of common challenges um, um, among those. And, and, and I think I'd like to maybe try and dig into some of those. So um, uh, in, in, maybe starting uh, with, uh, with you, Tony, um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you see as some of the, some of the big challenges in resolution uh, uh, and, and performing that, you talked about the, the the various users' needs and competing competing needs. But but how about as as the op op operator trying to actually um, uh, uh, deliver on those? What what are the challenges as you see, as you see them? Well, so so now most countries have moved to border analytics and targeting centres. You have them here in the states. There's one in Canada, there's one in London, there's one in Australia, where we gather a great deal of data about people and goods for that matter that are, that are crossing our borders. The supply chain data isn't always uh, entirely uh, accurate. 
so we have to rely on the information we have. But there is a, a great deal that I think you can do for us in, ter in terms of reconciling different data about s t to drill down to say that's the, that's the same person. I think that's a big win for, for border agencies, the sort of stuff you guys are doing, uh, to help us what we call sort of fuzzy matching type things where, you know, um, is it the right guy? I've spent lots of time, lots of effort on trying to figure out is this really him or is this someone pretending to be him or is this something else? So, so I think that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect I would like to mention, though, in, in, in terms of border management, it may be the same in financial services, is a growing use of biometric uh, technology. Uh, I, I found, I don't know if you read the blog, but I, one of my stories was that, you know, we were deporting some really nasty people, yardies, from South London back to Jamaica who were involved in shootouts, and they were back on the streets of London in two weeks' time. And, uh, you know, the police were kind of laughing at me, saying, well, you know, you, you guys at the border aren't doing very well, are you? Uh, he'd gone back to Kingston, he'd bribed someone in the passport office to give him a completely new passport. Perfectly genuine, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was uh, you know, it was in a different name. But so we started to, uh, to issue, uh, to, to fingerprint all our visa nationals. We could then, before we grant a visa to somebody, we match them against our visa database uh, and, our, and our biometric and our biographic databases. And now um, we, we have got, we have seen a growth in biometric watch lists if, if Interpol were here, they would tell you they've got vast uh, stores of, of, of fingerprints and photographs of people who are using multiple identities and, and I try to encourage border agencies when I go around the world to, to, to make use of the Interpol capabilities like they can with lost and stolen passports too because you know there are still, uh, it's still very very easy to, to get a a, a document, a travel document, if you've got money or connections in a different name, it's much harder, I've found, to, 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 to breach. You can still breach biometrics much harder. And we're also using biometrics to, to facilitate genuine people. You know, we're, we're all using gates now and kiosks, aren't we, to go through the border. That's all because of biometrics. So I think, you know, there is a huge growth now in this digital identity, which is a, a biometric as well as a biographic, which can be held as a single source of truth. And, and then once we start getting into that, then we're talking about a paradigm shift, I think, in the way we manage our borders. Excellent, Tony. Thank you. So you mentioned two big thing there, things there, data and biometrics. I want to come back to biometrics in a couple of minutes. Um, but just digging into data and really the, the, the source of the problem is, is, is that data quality or data manipulation intentionally, very often your business. Uh, Stefan, I know that uh, you run into uh, your share of, of dirty data from, from the world. Maybe you could talk about some of the challenges and what you've done to overcome those uh, and data I think, problems. Yeah, and I think, I mean, as you said, I mean, it's a combination. It's a combination of just noisy data by accident and, and those who try to even, you know, in a non-physical world, hide by intent. So we do a lot of work going after cyber criminals of, of all kinds. And... I think the interesting thing there would actually gives us some opportunity is that of course they want to hide from law enforcement as much as possible. At the same time, they have their networks and they need to keep, you know, they need to find their peers and you know, with whom they exchange tools and so on. So I think that's the key to actually being able to understand, you know, which different user handles they use, for example, on, on those forums. So we, we're doing, what we're doing is developing things like temporal analytics, looking at the, the temporal behavior of these guys, you know, when do they sleep, good indicator, you know, and so other, other, other kinds of patterns, really building a context around them so that the name itself, for example, does not become crucial in identifying the, the identical entities. Right, absolutely. So uh, um, uh, temporal and also the other thing I think might be embedded in there is uh, the accumulation of context over time, right? The more information you have, uh, over time and, and having time as that dimension, right? Not just a bunch, a big pile of information, but really having time as, as, a, as a piece of that. In there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, John, you're also in a big data platform and have to deal with a lot of messy data. Uh, um, can, can you care to comment on some of the challenges and what you've done so far to overcome some of those in, 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 your, in your world? Sure, yeah. Uh, I had the pleasure of being part of the DARPA MEMEX program, which uh, analyzed a lot of different uh, dark web and other types of uh, nasty, messy underworld data on the web. And just like Stefan was talking about, the patterns of life are an incredibly strong indicator. Uh, whether an account is the same person on two different forums is actually strongly correlated with how close in time they signed up. Like very simple patterns of life have a correlation. It's not strong enough to be like a deciding factor. It's just a weighted factor that is uh, beyond uh, statistically random correlated. The, the real challenge in all these, though, is how do you put a, together a picture that fills in all the gaps. So when you're dealing with all this data, the web is just covered with spam and duplication, and it takes large data processing to gather unique nuggets and then decide whether those nuggets 
coalesce around one identity? And then if it's all around one identity, which parts are true? And figuring out how to corroborate these different pieces is obviously beyond what we want machines to do. On the other hand, it's also beyond what an individual person can reasonably process. So there's this interface between uh, machines and people where if you really want to do a deep analysis of somebody, you, you have to have the machine do the right part and have a person do the right part and somehow mesh those together, which ends up being a user experience challenge. So I think the most exciting thing that we've done at Diffio in the last couple of years is this thing that we call uh, a collaborative operations journal, where when a person and a machine are working together on a project, we append to this log each of the actions that the machine and the person or a couple different people have done in this process, and then the machine can reprocess that sequence of operations to figure out what's likely to be the next thing that's right in the project. So figuring out how to model humans in that collaborative machine-human interaction, I think is maybe the most exciting big data thing we've done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, human, humans in the loop, and uh, Brian, I was going to go to you next. I saw you nodding there. Um, I'd, I'd, you know, please go ahead. What do you have to add there? So one of the challenges that has traditionally been faced and has not changed in 20 some odd years of doing this, for those of you who are history buffs, there was a case called Moonlight Maze, which was literally 20 years ago to this, uh, this year, where Russian hackers were stealing DARPA-like information from our systems. I actually sat with a gentleman at the Defense Intel Agency, who I won't name because I didn't clear this with him, um, who took out a marker with different colors on it and put the calendar in the days of the week that the hacker was attacking. And then we noticed he took two days off in the middle of a week. And we're like, why would he do that? And we looked at the time of day, which put it in a time zone that was you know, somewhere in the Eastern European region. And we realized it was an Orthodox holiday. Now, what everybody considers to be very trite today, because it's used in almost every attribution discussion of Mandian and others, and I, was, I also ran Microsoft Cybercrime Intelligence Program, so we did the same there. But that type of tradecraft came out of markers and printed out paper for a calendar. The other thing about, when we talk about this intent, the people, an adversary who posts on their Facebook page that they hate the United States, is not really the one that's really gonna cause us most of the problems at the borders. There, there were people exercising their freedom of speech. The people we're looking for, the derogatory information about them is in a CIA cable or a piece of paper that was photocopied in a safe house in Afghanistan and then put onto an image and put onto a hard drive with hundreds of millions of other pages, random lost passports, credit cards, and or comms intercepts where Johnny Bag of Donuts is going to attack something. Johnny Bag of Donuts is not the name I'm looking for on the passport. Anybody want to try, uh, for law enforcement, try and find Bubba in a southern motorcycle gang and get back to me. It's that kind of, there are 30 to 5 to 37 spellings of Muhammad, and that's after you've transliterated it, undone the handwriting and other things. So. One of the biggest struggles for all of us is the unstructured to structured data problem. And that's one of the things, if you're lucky, it's unstructured but computer optimized data where machine learning and other things can help. But if you start having to OCR it or other things, that's where the complexity remains and that's where your analytic challenge really gets difficult. So um, we were talking a bit there about um, uh, about, about humans uh, circling calendars, and, and John, you're, 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 you've got uh, end users working your application to provide some truth. I'd like to know uh, or, or hear people's perspectives on uh, on, on how that's going to evolve. How is the human in the loop going to evolve over time? Are computers going to uh, reduce the amount of time that, that, that people are involved? That's the promise, right? All this machine learning is going to make decisions for us, um, or uh, is, is 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 there still a role for for humans in uh, curating the information? Uh, that, that we use to make decisions. Um, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll leave that open. Do you, do you want to jump, jump in, Glenn? Sure. Go ahead. Okay, write this down, all right? Seriously. If you're involved in regulatory compliance, you need to do three things to satisfy regulators, whether you're on the AML side or you're on the bribery and corruption side. Number one is tone at the top. So those of you who are senior executives or on the boards, you have to have a tone at the top that's compliance. The second thing is you have to be reasonable and robust. And the third thing is it has to be auditable and traceable. Okay, so, 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 so getting with that, those, those are the kind of things that you have to do and you have to show for your systems. Um, <clears throat> so tone at the top, you can't do much about most of the people in this room. Auditable and tra uh, 
um, reasonable and robust, you can. Your screening processes, getting to who our identity is. Now, there are a lot of people, and I've heard a lot of um, presentations today that, yes, oh, we can do machine learning to, to figure out, um, I don't know, let's get 95%. I'm going to go against the grain and say that's really not possible because having worked a lot of DOJ cases, and I worked the largest anti-bribery and corruption case for the largest retailer in the world who I can't name, so you could figure out who that is. Okay, and the Department of Justice said we want you to automate as much as possible but we still need human intervention. The judgment has to be from humans. So if you take that, I don't see a point ever when we're gonna have machine learning, robotics, or AI that's going to be adjudicating a case, whether it's criminal or who are you, are you who you say you are, and if we have difficulties with that, some human's gonna have to come in there and make some kind of subjective, um, um, you know, some subj subjective argument or decision on that. So I don't see, machines taking over the, the entire process anytime soon. Now, I may be wrong, but that's just my view. Stefan, do you have something to add there? Well, I think the key word is, of course, anytime soon. Um, no, but I think I agree 100% with you, and I think you know what, what we can do with, with algorithms here is really to, to automate a lot of the routine work. Hopefully, we can use that, in particular, I would say, to, to get rid of a lot of the things that you shouldn't have to look at, you know, to find the irrelevant things. But then I think exactly the same, that in the end, you know, you want the machines to produce as good data as possible so the human can, in as short a time as possible, make the right decision. I think that's exactly what we need to strive for. Funny story we did last night. We were doing a, we, we were a vendor, vetting a vendor from South Africa that was selling to Brazil for this, for this and, and, and the name came up in South Africa. The fellow's name was uh, Mohammed Nazir. All right. And we ran it through one of the five compliance data. And you know what we got? Abu Nazir. Did anyone watch Homeland? There's a fictional character. So we have people wasting their time going to try to vet Abu Nazir from Homeland. I mean, th these are the things that just keep happening. You can't make this stuff up. It just keeps happening again and again. That's the kind there of- There are some real Abu Nazirs. There may be, but this guy was from, <laughs> this guy was based in Lebanon and it actually said fictional character on Homeland. Well, why, why did that person even get, how did he get person so get that's not the database? perfect uh, character to hide under, right? Uh, exactly. Great, thank you. So, um, so that, that's some interesting perspective on, on the challenge that we have, and some some uh, of, of the uh, the ways that we see maybe human uh, interaction changing over time, and maybe maybe not going away for some time, um, and, and computers pot potentially becoming just uh, a, a part of the, a part of the piece, a, a part of the puzzle, not uh, replacing it uh, wholesale. Um, so, um, I think that uh, uh, looking down the future of identity resolution. Um, and maybe, Tony, I'll start, start with you. Um, what, what, what would you say the, the future of identity resolution looks like? I think the problem we've got is that no two countries have got the same identity management strategy. Everybody's got a slightly different perspective on, on, on this. So, you know, some countries do issue national identity cards, you know, with, with a biometric on it at a certain age. They're very good at managing their own uh, population, but they're not very good at managing the, um, you know, the temporary or the transient population that go to that country, uh, whereas uh, other countries like us, you know, in the UK, like we're, you know, we're sort of a bit paranoid about this, I suppose. You know, we were going to have a national identity card, then we decided not to have one. Um, so there's a lot of people in the UK pretending to be British, accessing services when they're not British, really. But how would we know whether they are or whether they're not? because we haven't got a national identity register to check them against. So, I mean, I, I do think that, there's a, that there is a lot in, in the technical here and the art of the possible, um, but I do think there's also a lot in the political policy uh, legislative frameworks that we adopt globally. And I'm, I'm really quite interested to see how much momentum we get behind this idea, you know, of some kind of global digital identity how many people would put their hands up and say, I'd quite like to be a part of that. I certainly would personally because I travel across a lot of borders and I really am very happy to share my information with whoever wants it to a greater or less extent. But that, that does not apply in the European Union. There's some real concerns uh, about sh data sharing, which have kiboshed a couple of really big programs and we've spent an awful lot of money, public money in the UK, on programs which didn't carry right the way through at the end because of a a policy or legal constraint. So, so I think you know, it, it's it's much more complicated than just uh, you know being able to sort out the the capability, the, the the capability of AI and things like that. I've got no doubts about the capabilities, 
but I'm not sure globally we're joined up on this, and, and that's, a, that's a real challenge for global borders. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a global idea is, is, a, is a fascinating idea and one that I think uh, could, serve, could serve the world well. Um, but that, that helps us at borders alone. Um, I'd like to get other perspectives. Where, where, where are the edges of that? Where, does that where, where do we need to pick up and still, we're still going to be ident resolving identities for, with people that, you know, and, and for and, and, uh, intelligence against those identities. So, John? Exactly, like you were just saying, I, I think if we solve the global ID problem, then suddenly we have the global trust problem. Because just because we know who they are, we don't know what their intent is. And they don't necessarily have one intent, right? We have all these intents of all the citizens all the different organizations, all the possible collectives, it's a, a dazzling number of possible configurations of trust. So I think the, the challenge that we might get to solve a couple steps down the road from where we are now is the one of how to model that trust in a more primitive, fundamental way that everybody uses because it's like, it's like math. You know, if we, if we could have an algebra of trust that was agnostic of individuals, wasn't controlled by a single broker, wasn't controlled by a single government or, or middleman. This is obviously what everybody hopes the blockchain will bring. It's obviously way beyond the current blockchain stuff, which is slow and weird. But maybe there is the possibility of having something like the algebra of trust. And that's where I hope we get to you know, do real problem solving. Go ahead, Brian. So, and the, you raised a couple of really great points, is the context of the trust question, this went back to some of the things uh, we met uh, last evening and discussed, is I may trust you enough, or not trust you enough, to give you a loan in the United States. However, we still trust you to go to Britain. In fact, we try and ship them there just as a regular. <laughs> However, and what context is needed for the business to understand that part of your identity or your intent? If you had a, and I'm not espousing or, or, or uh, in any way stopping the discussion of global identities, what I'll say for the techies in the audience is the OSI model of all the layers of a computer system, you all are painfully familiar, there are seven levels. The problem lays in levels eight, nine, and 10. Politics, religion, and funding. That's where the logical problem is broken and nothing you do in the bottom seven layers is gonna solve the issue. It becomes a policy issue if you just want to group them as layer eight. The context of that identity, like your credit score, the credit score, which has existed, each of you has a number. Half of you or more don't even know what that number is because you're not getting a mortgage this year. Others of you signed up and you have it on your cell phone and you can look at it right now. No one in this room understands how the algorithm works. You understand things you could do to hope to influence it. You have no idea what that algorithm is or how to directly impact it. Now we're talking about layering that, which we should, and which innovation should come from a lot of companies, including the ones represented here. But if you don't even understand your credit score, <laughs> that's been around for quite some time, imagine what you're not gonna understand about how your health insurance takes your web surfing and decides whether or not to issue a policy. That's why protections in a great open discussion like this one are needed for them. So I, I, I didn't mean to. I, 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 no, no, please. Oh, go ahead. So I have a little bit different take on this. I've always been a very laissez-faire person when it comes to uh, personal freedoms. However, I'm starting to rethink that a lot because I think we're we're just about, if not at a tipping point, with identity, social networking, and the things that are tearing this country in particular about. Now, one other thing, how many people, when they read something on Yahoo or on Huffington Post or Drudge, go to the comments section? I know that's one of the, exactly, right? You almost can't help yourself. And you look at these comments and you say to yourself, oh my God, okay? I remember a time in this country when I sat on a train going to New York and I actually read a newspaper and I would get to the, to the uh, letters to the editor and it would say, John Smith, uh, Milburn, New Jersey. Or it would say, right, or, 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 or Tony Bag of Donuts. Okay, uh, uh, Long Island. And once in a while you would say, with a uh, name withheld by request, okay. But today, that's completely different. You go on any of these sites, there, there's, who knows if they're Russian bots, sock puppets, whatever you wanna call it, the comments are incredible. And, and they're, they're divisive, okay, they're derogatory, and no one knows who's doing that. I'm actually calling for an end to that. I think in order to post on any internet site, on, on any public site, we have to know who you are, 
on where you are and, and if it's actually you. Because if we don't stop this, okay, this country is, is never going to come together. It's going to go out to every other country. It's almost like social networking has caused a, a, a divisiveness. So I actually think social networking may be the answer to creating a global identity. What if we turn that, what if Mark Zuckerberg got religion and turned that around and said, every person on, on Facebook, we're going to have to vet you. We need your picture. We need to know where you are and where you live. And now we start, in, instead, of, instead of people, the people can opt in. It doesn't become government run, because I don't like government run stuff, even though I used to be with the government. It becomes something that you can opt in. And now we're using social networking for probably one of the things that it was meant to be used for, to bring us together, to get some commonality instead of ripping us apart. John, you're dying to add to that? Just as a, a question for the audience to think about, what if we push that uh, fully authenticated worldview as low down in the internet as we could go to the IP packet layer? So that you could never send an IP packet of any flavor without first stamping it with your fully authenticated identity. Just think how much that would change everything about the internet, right? Like everything from DDoS attacks to the way you send email, right? Totally change it. IPv8, maybe, but you know. Yeah. 2040. It, it's much faster now. The singularity is going to happen before then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't actually believe I'm the one that's going to pose this issue. Um, free speech. Uh, and the thing that funded the internet, I'll remind you, was something where people in their own privacy and adult websites, that's actually the, where the money came from. Um, having run watch listing, having been doing law enforcement investigation for years and years, I still have an absolute belief in the ability of people to do things without having to declare their identity within the confines of society and our laws. Um, and that's the struggle is if every connection from your home computer is franked with your identity, every story you read can be tracked, everything you do, and all of those things in your rights to do could also become part of what is known about you in context and companies you'll never know. We know Equifax, great company. We know TransUnion, great company. There are data aggregators that have 100, 500,000 word files on each of us. We have no idea what the names of these companies are, where they got our data, how they got it, and what they're doing with it. Those are some concerns as we talk about identity unification for the good of a consumer. The unintended use of that data is something that also must be, must be considered. Agreed. Oh, absolutely. I know you're on the side of that. I'm just raising the well, issue I, for I'm on general sides. I, I, <laughs> On both sides. I, 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 well stated. We, 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 there, there, isn't not. A, there isn't like a definitive, you know, good guy, bad guy answer to this. It, unfortunately, it'd be much easier if there were. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you take that argument, though, but, you know, back before there was porn on the, you know, I, I mean, I mean, when I was 20 or 30, was, okay? Time. Wait, wait, for, I mean, before, before it was on the internet. That was before the internet. You walked into a place, you, you, bought, you bought Playboy or you bought Hustler. I don't know if there's any women magazines in town. But, but still, I don't, know what, I, I don't know what the great difference is. I mean, por looking at pornography, as long as it's not underage or, or, or anything like that, there's nothing illegal about that. No, I, it's, still, it's still the privacy concerns I, I, are, are there. I think yeah. People, yeah. Pe people have different notions of what derogatory means. And uh, yes. it, it goes back to the notion of intent and uh, you know, what, what, the sort of puritanical notion or non-puritanical notion of different cultures. And just as you were saying earlier, different nations have different uh, strategies for handling national IDs in a very deep way. It's not just like a superficial uh, politicians decided to have disagreements about this. It's like deep in the culture about whether or not we're going to be super libertarian or something, you know, we're going to act like we're not libertarian, but we're going to secretly be libertarian, all these different permutations of how to think about identity. The internet enables only one way of doing it right now. And maybe we can be more sophisticated. Maybe we can have some routers that let you do authenticated things and others that do anonymous things. Just I think technology has a lot more uh, freedom that we haven't right. explored yet. Right. So inter interesting, I, I'm going to bring it back around identity resolution for a minute, but I'm going to tie it in. Um, and, and this will probably be the last topic uh, before, or last question here before we move to, uh, to Q&A. So, um, uh, Tony, earlier you touched on biometrics. Uh, there was a little talk, uh, John, with you of, of, about blockchain, and now you know, the idea of, 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 a global, uh, of a global ID. And I think all of these are, um, are, are potentially valuable innovations and valuable uh, uh, technologies, but uh, I'm still curious, what, what does the future look like um, considering that so much data is still not connected? 
right? You're still gonna have data unless every IP packet is fingerprinted, <laughs> right? Uh, and, even then, and even then, there's gonna be non-digital data, perhaps, still, in the world that's, that's, that's not connected. So um, ideas about you know, the, f the future of identity resolution in, in a world that e even, if it, even if we have got blockchain and biometrics, um, uh, what, what, does that, what does that look like for, uh, for identity resolution um, for all that disconnected data? I, I'll, op I'll open it up. Well, I mean, so there's always going to be disconnected data. I think that's the simple answer. And I think, you know, I mean, about your remark here about, uh, about having everything stamped or identifiable, you know, I mean, that works well if you live in a democracy maybe, but, you know, there are places on Earth where I would definitely like people to use the Internet as a vehicle for, you know, overthrowing dictators and so on. So, and I think if you had that enforced everywhere, you would very efficiently sort of preserve a bad state in some places. Well, that's, a, that's a great point. And, and again, I, I don't want to sound like some, well, I do. I mean, that's what this, <laughs> this, that's what this country is, was all about at one point, okay? I mean, we're not perfect, but pushing the bounds of freedom out to the world. And I can't really think of a better way to do it than what we really invented here, which is the whole social networking um, paradigm. And we should be pushing that out. I, and, and, you, and you're right, it gets rid of dictators. Okay, one of the things, uh, you know, I've always said, instead of going to war with North Korea, we should drop a whole bunch of cell phones, computers, and all kinds of, uh, you know, access to the internet and let people see what's going on. I mean, that's one of the biggest contributions this country can make to the world. I think we should be pushing it all the time. Yeah, I think one thing we struggle in government and agencies with is whether or not the internet is a reliable uh, source to, to, to check. And, um, you know, one of the stories I, I told you last night was I, I did all the border security for London 2012 Olympics. And we were operating at a threat level which was severe. A, a terrorist attack was highly likely. And all the names were coming to me on my team to check against whatever we could check them against. And so that raises the question, well, do you check names of, of, of Olympians against the <coughs> internet? We could do that. I'll probably give you lots of stories about how many gold medals they've won and it didn't take a lot of time, but, but you know, one guy was actually, you had this Megan's Law, uh, which you at that time in the US had published on the internet of, of paedophiles. Uh, we didn't, we, we, you know, they, they weren't on, on a global watch, they weren't on my watch list, but somebody did know that, or looked this guy up and said, look, did you know, boss, that this guy's actually a paedophile? Which it means you're excludable uh, if you're a foreign national from entry into the UK. Now, I, I wouldn't have known that he was a paedophile had I not checked the internet, actually, because you had used the internet in, in, in your wisdom to, to, to put, make, because there was a movement here that actually these people need to be, these names need to be published, and, and other countries have moved towards it. But, but I think I would still, if I'm still in government, even now I'm not, I still really struggle with the internet and, and what bits of the internet are, are, are used, could be used by us uh, as a risk assessment tool. But how much stuff on the internet would actually be damaging, in fact, to, to what we're trying to achieve, given that, as you say, you know, people use the internet for a whole manner of things, and actually it's not really relevant to what we're trying to, to, to do. So I, I'm still really, you know, the jury's out for me on the internet. The, the one point about that, and the Megan's Law for uh, sexual offenders, uh, pedophilia being a subcomponent, um, at the National Counterterrorism Center, that was not a topic for our the watch lists we provided to airports and other things. The DEA provided its watch list as the authoritative for smuggling, and other watch lists came from all over the country in the context of the derogatory material. The office two doors from mine was the redress office, where if you felt you were on a watch list or you were actually on one, there was a legal process to discuss what information was being used to make a government decision about you. Now, commercially, you often don't know the decision of the material supporting decision. There is no, f there may be a redress process. You don't know where it is or why or what you would ask it to do in relation to your mortgage or any other decision. So that's one of the things when you start talking about identity and government, the non-repudiation, the ability to redress, the permanence, the impact on the life of a person, a real life person, on the decisions made of that dossier are, are much more significant than access to or not access to a website or other things. So as you get into that depth of the discussion for an 
immigration decision, can you go to the Olympics, a great example, very great example. There is a lot more complexity to this than just, you know, and it goes down to how are we unifying the data? Which records actually mean that person and are they significant, legally relevant and appropriate? If you get to unify them, then that's a different problem. Stefan, you want to have the final word on this one, and then we're going to. I was just going to add that I think you know two or two points here. I mean, the the thing that the more governments start trusting the internet, the worse the risk becomes that people will use it to poison the system. You know, by spreading rumors. I mean, if I want to win the Olympics, I'll spread rumors about my competitors being pedophiles. You know, and you'll have to investigate. It might take enough time that they won't be able to go there. So you know, that's the downside of doing that. I, I got. Uh, can I jump in? I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Again. Final, final word, and then uh, we'll have time for just a couple questions. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I like to think that most of us, in decision-making capacity, are smart enough to ferret out the, uh, the ridiculous stuff from real stuff. Example: Facebook. I, as, as the other side of me is an investigator. I still have a firm. I still investigate crimes. Okay. So if I'm looking on something in Facebook, I may, I may look at that to get some background and a feel, but. Uh, but to me, it, that's noise. When I go to LinkedIn, however, which isn't perfect, I, I, I always know someone, I, yeah, I know a guy, right? That's what I mean, I know a guy, and, and that guy knows a guy and knows a guy, and, and, it's, and, and you, can, you can figure out by using the internet, and, and that, that's how you use it. I mean, things like Facebook, Twitter, and everything, it, to me, it's a grain of salt. But you take something like LinkedIn, and then there's five or six bona fide data providers out there, you know, things, places like B, uh, BVD, Dun & Bradstreet, LexisNexis, they're not perfect, uh, RDC, but if you take that with open source intelligence and use the internet, you can probably pretty well get to the identity of a person pretty quickly, and again, 98% of the time, it's right. The other 2%, that's what you have investigators for. Thank, thanks, Glenn, that's perfect. So, so bringing in, I think, another important dimension here, we talked about the temporal aspect and, and gathering information over time and de-risking, but I think then relationships, I think another really important dimension. So um, we're not gonna have a lot of time for questions, but let's go ahead real quick, um, and we'll uh, we'll start right over here. Um, go ahead. Sure. Can, uh, can you just stand up real quick, your, your company, your name, and... Yep. All right, who wants to take this one and then we'll try and open it for another question. So uh, for in the context of, of border security watch listing and in the context of terrorism, I'll leave the rest of the what the government's doing in watch listing to itself. And a, a caveat, I'm not in the government anymore, so I don't speak for them. We used uh, a lot of field matching and advanced machine learning in terms of recommending records to be merged, recommending identities that either were related by by uh, name variants, aliases, known associates, or other things, to group records from a massively unreadable batch into small batches of 5, 10, or 50 that an analyst could sit and, it was called a sharded identity. That's what allowed the underwear bomber to attack. We had derogatory information on part of it, his identity, and then we had his passport number and other things on another part, and they didn't match up. So that's why I was hired into the government, was to fix that. So we used machine learning in that text on structured data or unstructured data that was manipulated into a structure and then analyzed by a human because the ultimate impact was the decision on life and limb and travel of the person under discussion. Yeah, I think where the machine, machinery has helped is in the analytics of, of, of the data that we've got. That's been hugely valuable. We do do profiling uh, in borders. Um, where we get intelligence, unstructured intelligence quite often, unrefined intelligence about individuals that might or might not fit a profile which would be crossing a border. We can feed that in, that's done by a person, uh, basically as an expert who's know, who knows what, what kind of the threat is. But the machine is capable of refining that data and spreading that data around different, you know, so we've got more chance, I think, of catching the individual that we're trying to stop. But I still, I mean, I'm, I am old-fashioned. I've been in this business an awful long time. I still think it takes a person to stop a person. And I don't underestimate the power of these kind of conversations we're having here. They're going to be valuable to the criminal fraternities in terms of their own capabilities to defeat 
whatever we're trying to do by building their own systems. And, and, and so I do think that ultimately it's still a game of, of cowboys and Indians. You know, uh, you, you good guys and your bad guys are going to constantly be racing to the top. And crime does pay, I'm, I'm afraid, in my experience, in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So, so I think, you know, you, you will always need humans. But the officers that I talk to, the next generation officers coming into the borders business, they want the sorts of tools you guys have got. They really, really want those tools. But, you, you know, you say you're not going to do away with the officer. No, you're not, because the officer is the one that's going to catch the bad guy in the end. All right, so we're going to be just about out of time. I'll take one more question um, right back here in the middle, and uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. Wrap up. Right, so if anyone didn't hear that, so uh, um, how, how might uh, trusted uh, um, um, identities uh, of, of people online uh, help out? John, do you want to take that? Ultimately, we have to figure out how to make it distributed so that it's not like one budget that's supposed to verify the identities of all of humanity. We're, we're just too big and we're too complicated in our uh, collections, our groupings. So we have to figure out how to do distributed trust intelligence that still accretes usefully in some trustable way so that when somebody does a little bit of work, it accretes to the collective good. That's the major technology barrier. Any one single consortium is going to end up being an island, unfortunately, with today's technology, I think, my opinion. Stefan, last comment? Yeah, well, and then, of course, I mean, since identities are prone to theft, I mean, you know, it's much more interesting to steal a uh, trusted identity than another one. So I think there will still be problems. Excellent. Well, I want to thank uh, our fantastic panel here today for, uh, for the great conversation, and thank you for everyone in the audience. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, I know we ran out of time. If people have more questions, I'm going to ask everyone just join me right outside the, uh, the room here so the next session can get uh, started. And then, um, again, my name is Chris Mack with Basis Technology, and we do have a booth here. So if you've got questions for me, uh, find me over there on the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you.